Hi, I'm Dylan Paris, and today I want to talk about the new M1 iPad Pros that were just announced on the 20th. These are really fascinating devices. If you've seen some of my more recent iPad Pro videos, then you probably know I have a lot of issues with these devices, specifically how most music production software runs on them and the amount of glitches and other kinds of issues that just pop up all the time when I'm trying to use basically any iPad DAW or any iPad plugin and especially when I try to use them all together. Now my last iPad Pro was the 12.9 inch 2020 iPad Pro. It had 256 gigs of internal storage and six gigs of random access memory. And I really thought on paper that that device would be the best portable music making product I ever had, at least in that form factor. There were things about it that were great. Uh, all of the pros seem to be really good at screen recording while doing music production. Although I will say that the 2020 Pro also had more issues with that than any other pro I'd had before. In hindsight, when I look back at all the issues I had with that iPad, I do wonder if I should have just returned it. If maybe there was actually something wrong with just that iPad. Because every time I tried to make a video with it, I encountered like really truly deal breaking issues. Audio crackles, incompatibility with plugins that should have been compatible, random crashes and DAWs of all kinds. The only iPad app I've actually used that has consistently always worked for me is Core Gadget. I think the reason that is true is because Core Gadget is really standalone. Uh, you're not opening Audio Uni V3s inside of Quark's audio engine and allowing them to play in the same space. And I think that is a big part of why Core Gadget seems so stable relative to everything else. So that's kind of a long preamble, right? But I wanted to set the table of the context for the iPad Pro as it is right now, because what's about to happen is so interesting. And I've noticed this cycle with Apple. They'll really improve the hardware of the iPad Pro and then wait a little bit to make software that catches up to it. I'm thinking a lot about the first of the new thin bezel iPads, the third generation iPad Pro. That device when it came out was still running iOS. It wasn't even iPad OS yet. And it took, I think two years for it to get keyboard and mouse support, I could be wrong, maybe it was just one year with the introduction of iPad OS, but it took another year for the Magic Keyboard to come out. And really before the launch of the M1 chip, Max, the iPad seemed to be coming into its own as a portable hybrid computer where you could use a mouse and keyboard, you could use a touchpad. On paper, it seemed like the perfect device. And for artists, specifically people drawing with the Apple Pencil, or doing illustration work, it seems like it actually has hit that pro level that Apple's advertising. Photographers as well can get a lot of use out of the iPad as it exists now. But an audience that I feel has been really left behind and not really taken into consideration by Apple is the music producing community. And that's weird for me because the music producing community on iPad is one of the most creative and enthusiastic communities I've ever encountered. So much of the early growth of this channel has been because of the iPad music community. And if you're part of that community, I hope you know how much I appreciate you and what you're doing. And then when I'm criticizing Apple for the stuff they're doing when it comes to music production, I'm, I'm not criticizing you for choosing to try to make it work because I understand what is so exciting about the iPad. That's why I keep trying <laughs> to make it more than it seems like it can be. But that being said, I, I do think Apple underserves the music community on iPad in a way that's really weird because of how much they cater to the music community on Mac. And maybe their reasoning is, well, the Mac is where the musicians are, and why would we go bring them over to iPad? But at the same time, it's like, well, that's, that was true of videographers, and that was true of photographers, and that was true of artists who were using Wacom tablets before you really perfected drawing on the iPad. So Apple's never been one to stop from cannibalizing their own market. I don't understand why they're letting the current context of iPad music exists as it is. I have a longer video just on Logic Pro on the iPad Pro and how I really want to see that software and more professional software come to the iPad Pro. And that honestly still felt like kind of a pipe dream until really recently because your average iPad, even the Pro, only has around four gigs of RAM. It was only the one terabyte models of the 2018 iPad Pros that had even six gigs. The 2020 Pros all have six gigs. So if you were just targeting last year's model, then you had a lot of RAM to work with. But for the most part, iPads have like three to six gigs of RAM, which is a lot for a lot of tasks, but it's really not for sample-based music plugins, especially the kind of like orchestral libraries you might find on PCs and Macs. And I think that is one of the big limitations that's held back more pro level music software from coming to the iPad. I'm talking specifically about full versions of Ableton, 
of Pro Tools, FL Studio, Cubase, and Logic Pro especially. So again, a lot of preamble, but the reason I bring this up is because Apple has now introduced the M1 iPad Pros. There's the 11 inch with the same screen as last year, and then there's the 12.9 inch with the XDR display, which is so beautiful. It's extremely tempting for me to buy it just for the screen alone. And the thing about these iPads is they're saying it's the same M1 chip that's in the MacBook Pro, the MacBook Air, and the M1 Mac Mini, uh, as well as the new iMac that's coming out. And if that's true, it will obviously be limited by thermals in a way that even the MacBook Air isn't because the MacBook Air gets to put the processor in a separate enclosure from the screen, whereas the iPad Pro, everything is very close together. The MacBook Air does this without a fan. iPads are never out a fan. They're probably never going to have a fan. That said, I'm really curious what the performance difference will be, if it's really gonna be one-to-one -one between MacBook Air, MacBook Pro, and iPad Pro, or at least MacBook Air and iPad Pro because neither will have a fan. And the other thing about the M1 chip is that it has eight gigabytes and 16 gigabytes of RAM, depending on the configuration you choose. So for both the 11 and 12.9 inch iPad Pros, these have eight gigabytes of RAM up to the 512 gigabyte model. And then if you go one terabyte or two terabytes, they tie the RAM upgrade to that as well. So it's expensive, but you then get a one terabyte, 16 gigabytes of RAM iPad Pro in either 11 inch or 12.9 inch models. And I'm gonna be honest with you, for all the negativity I've had on my channel recently about iPads, when I was watching this presentation, I almost had my wallet out immediately. Uh, I'm a little bummed that they couldn't bring the XDR display to the 11 inch, because I did feel like the 12.9 inch iPad felt a little too big. And if I was gonna get one of these, I would want the one with the XDR display, specifically because I really like consuming content Content on tablets, but when you do it at night with any current iPad, there's a lot of grays in the darker areas of scenes, especially if you've got black bars on your screen, or if you're watching something that takes place at night, even on the lowest brightness settings on any iPad I've used, it's still just too gray. You're not getting that light experience that I get on my OLED display on my phone or on my TCL 6 Series 2020 model with mini LED backlighting zones. And so I'm really excited about the XDR display, enough that I was like, well, between the M1 chip and the XDR and 16 gigs of RAM and a terabyte of space, that iPad is looking really tempting. And I'm not gonna be the first person to say this, but the software story is what's really weird about this thing. Now, I think we're a couple months away from WWDC, the developer conference where Apple really showcases its next software, both for Mac and for iOS slash iPadOS. And the rumors going into WWDC are that we might see subscription versions of Final Cut Pro and potentially Logic Pro for the iPad. I would imagine that that same app would be a universal app, and so it would also probably be a subscription on Mac as well. And that's an interesting idea. You know, because the Macs are going M1, it's possible that down the line we'll get to a point where every app will be universal and we won't have to have this conversation of why pay for a super powerful iPad? It's more expensive than a MacBook Air with the same processor, but can't run equivalent software. But that's where we are right now, right? I mean, that's the real question. Day one, the software story of the iPad Pro M1 model seems really weird to me because every iPad app up to this point has been designed probably targeting three gigs of RAM or less, probably targeting the processor speed of like an A10, even though we're all the way up to an A14. When you're building the software, you can't just make it for the most recent iPads historically. You wanna hit a big audience of potential users. And because Apple supports iPads with updates for years and years, like five years for each model, it's hard for me to imagine a company making a DAW or making a video editing app specifically to target just the six gigabyte versions of these iPad Pros, let alone the new eight and 16 gigabyte iPad Pros. And so I think I join a chorus of people saying, well, if this thing has the same processor as the latest MacBooks and the iMac and the Mac mini, and if it has the same RAM configurations as those computers, why can't it run the same software as those computers? You can connect a keyboard, you can connect a mouse or a touchpad to the iPad Pro. It has the same processor, it has the same RAM. I am looking at this, you know, $1,500 without a keyboard case, without a pencil, 12.9 inch XDR iPad Pro with a terabyte of space. I believe that's the terabyte model. Actually, the terabyte model might be 1,800. Yeah, I think it is. Anyway, it's in that space. It's in the mid to high teens of hundreds, you know, like 15 to 18 hundred dollars. Why would you buy that computer when you could get an M1 MacBook Air for much cheaper or even a refurbished MacBook Pro M1 for cheaper? I saw a one terabyte, 16 gig refurbished MacBook Pro the other day for $1,600 and I almost bought that like immediately. 
I held off because I have a Windows laptop that actually works really well for me that I'll probably end up making a video about, but I haven't yet. But yeah, I'm looking at these two computers and it just doesn't really make sense right now. And so I think we're in the tick of the TikTok hardware to software story of the iPad Pro. You know, when the first iPad Pro came out in 2015, it was this giant thing. And I think it had the original Apple Pencil that you charged by plugging it into the bottom. It looked really goofy. And people were trying to figure out what do I even do with this device? And now we're at a point where a whole ecosystems of music production, which already kind of existed, but have really flourished under the iPad Pro lines, they exist now. Artists are using pros in professional work. Uh, even video editors, you know, I ran my channel off of LumaFusion for a couple of months and it was doable. Admittedly, going back to a PC for video editing after that was like a breath of fresh air though. And I don't think I would ever recommend LumaFusion and an iPad is the only way you run your channel if you have any other choice. But if I'm right, and this is the tick, then I'm really curious about the talk, right? I'm really curious about the other shoe dropping and what it looks like when the software matches the hardware specifications of these new iPad Pros. Because for me, the iPad Pro has always been the dream device if it could really run the software I wanna use and if I could really run it consistently. Even if just all the apps that are already on iPad Pro actually worked and didn't glitch out all the time, that'd be a huge win. If you add Logic and potentially Ableton and Final Cut and Premiere Pro, real versions of professional apps running on these devices, and they work the way they work is consistently on a Mac, that would be a dream come true. Because then you have the single slab, right? And especially if they can get the XDR display into an 11 inch, you could have this tiny thing that you put onto a little dock or onto a keyboard case and plug into a monitor and suddenly it's everything, right? That's the dream to me. I mean, the biggest dream version would be a foldable phone that you could dock into a display and it's, every, you know, Samsung does a version of this, but there aren't the kind of creative apps I want on Android. So that's still not really the platform for me to try to do that for now. As more hardware developers move towards ARM, I think we're getting, you know, five to hopefully less years out from really powerful transforming style devices that can be a desktop, that can be a tablet, that can be a laptop. That to me is the dream of the pro. And and, and the things I would need to see change in the iPad Pro are the introduction of more professional music software, real consistency in the audio unit V3 standard that currently just is not there. Every time I try to use an audio unit in some kind of DAW, something conflicts. And it's like, you've had years and years and years to develop this. Why are we constantly finding these bugs? Why does this just not work in the way the VST standard has worked the entire time? I've used PCs and Macs for the last 12 years. It's just not the same on iPads. So we really need to fix that. And if we can't, we need to bring VST to the iPad. We need to start letting native instruments and Arturia apps run on these things, especially if they're already working on Big Sur with the M1 chips. We need to just start running those apps on the iPads as well. And really, I think the other really big final thing they need to do especially with Thunderbolt 4 support and the whole 6K display thing they were talking about with the new iPad Pro is we really need support for different aspect ratios. I don't care if I can plug an external monitor into an iPad if it's just gonna be a little 4-3 or you know matching the aspect ratio of whatever iPad you're using with black bars on the side mirroring what's on the iPad, right? That's not useful to me. Maybe to you, and, that, and that's awesome if it's you. I mean, I'm not saying there's no inherent value in having just a bigger version of your screen, but to me, the dream is you plug in the iPad, you've got a little screen there, and then you've got a full screen of scalable window apps, the way you do on Mac OS, right? Or even just wider versions of whatever apps you're running. A full screen GarageBand, a full screen Logic, a full screen LumaFusion. LumaFusion will let you run just the video preview on the other screen, but everything else is gonna be black bars again. And I really think aspect ratio support, scaling apps, all of this stuff you can see already happening, right? There are apps that run on the M1 Max that do have some of that scaling going on. And I'm really hopeful that as time moves on, we will start to see this flexibility in iPad software. But in the meantime, I'm looking at these very expensive iPad Pros, the ones with, you know, the 12.9 inch model with the XDR display and one terabyte of storage and 16 gigs of RAM. And, and you have to ask a question right now, who is this for? Because if you're just an artist and you just need the screen quality, well then get the eight gigabyte RAM model and get the get smaller storage. You probably don't need more than 256, right? Just back up your files if you have to. If you're a videographer, are you gonna buy an $1,800 computer to run LumaFusion? Like, are you kidding me? iMovie? I mean, at that price point, it's only $400 less than my i7, 32 gigs of RAM, M.2 one terabyte SSD with another open M.2 slot. I put another terabyte into it, an RTX 3070 on a 4K OLED laptop. Specifically this guy, the Gigabyte Aero 15, 
the 2021 model. Now it's it's a big boy <laughs> compared to an iPad. So maybe that's the trade is just size, right? But this thing can play games in 4K. This thing can export my 20 minute uh, 4K video files in like five minutes. It can run Ableton with my Arturia V collection and native instruments, plugins and serum and do so much professional work that just is not possible on an, an iPad that's now gonna cost only a couple hundred dollars less. And that's just, that's a weird value proposition to me. So I'm really curious about the software story of the iPad Pro moving forward. I guess the final question is, am I gonna buy one of these? <laughs> Logically speaking, the smart side of me is saying no. There's no reason for me to buy this. You know, the only reasons I could see for me to buy this are the fact that I run a YouTube channel and that my iPad Air 3 does not have very good search engine optimization in 2021. For whatever reason, people seem a lot more interested in the same app running on an iPad 2020 than they do in an iPad Air 3. And I kind of get it, but it's kind of dumb because all of these apps run really similarly across the hardware spectrum. So part of me does want to get the 12.9 inch iPad Pro 2021, specifically for that screen. I mean, that would be the, you know, why buy this? Maybe this screen. There's a lot of people like, well, it's the same as a MacBook Air. It's like, well, the MacBook Air is a 400 nits brightness max output. The regular usage max output of the XCR display on the iPad Pro is 1000 nits and peak brightness for HDR content is 1600 nits. That's ridiculous. It essentially matches the specs of the XDR display that's thousands and thousands of dollars. So if you just need a really nice screen, I guess that's a reason. And that's kind of pro, right? That's a pro level display. But it's just it's just a weird software hardware configuration thing right now. And so I'm tempted to buy one, especially the XDR version. I don't think you need 16 gigs of RAM on an iPad, but the fact they're offering it is really intriguing it makes me think like well they have to imagine there's a reason for this right is it just because you can't make an m1 chip with less ram or is there a software story we don't fully know yet that's coming down the pipeline and when it does you're going to be happy you had that much ram i don't know this is how i trick myself into buying stuff all the time <laughs> but i'm sure you'll find out in future videos on this very channel so if you're interested in that Subscribe if you've enjoyed the content of this video, give it a thumbs up. I've got music on Spotify under the name Dylan Paris, including my album, There's Something Better. And I'd be very honored if you checked it out. I appreciate your time and I hope you have a wonderful day. All right, bye.